Select County Sheriff's Office, Deputy Salazar. Uh, yes, hi. My name is Paula Mooney, and I was calling to confirm reports of a 22 rifle found on October 3rd, about 200 yards away from the remains of Suzanne Morphew. Okay, man, so uh, you can call CBI. That's who, where the tip line is and the email as well, okay? Okay, so you can't confirm or deny those reports. About. I cannot give you any information, ma'am. That is the CBI's, and uh, I can give you the number to 719-312-7530. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yes, ma'am. Bye. You as well. Okay, that was me calling Sawatch County. I was trying to confirm the reports that have come out recently about a rifle, a 22, being found only 200 yards away from the remains of Suzanne Morphew. I've linked to the YouTuber below. He's called Cold Case Cause, and he streamed live on October 3rd, 2023. He's also put up some photos of what he found, an Italian-made rifle kind of down there in the mud. He said it was only about 200 yards away from where Suzanne Morphew's remains were found. And of course, he doesn't know if it's related to her case at all, but it is curious and it's kind of setting YouTube on fire. Like, is this true or not? Now this guy has search and rescue experience. He has his dogs out there. He claimed that it was a rifle that CBI missed. He said they didn't search that far down. I was thrown off a little bit because he said that a woman named Brandy usually answers the phone in Sea-Watch County, but that didn't sound like Brandy to me. You can tell the guy couldn't tell me anything as I expected. He couldn't confirm or deny the reports of this 22 being found and turned over. He just led me to the Suzanne Morphew tip line, which is just like a voicemail box. Speaking of 22 rifles, I know they're very popular, but on August 9th, 2021, in the court transcripts, which we're going over, Barry Morphew was asked about ammunition, and Barry did say there might be some 22 shells in a drawer somewhere. We know there was a 22 round reportedly found on the bedroom floor, the master bedroom floor of Barry and Suzanne Morphew's. Also in the August 10th, 2021 transcript, also coming up, Barry is talking about shooting chipmunks. FBI agent Johnny Grusing was paraphrasing Barry and he said, yeah, I shoot chipmunks. That's why his phone was darting all over the place and his property. Grusing said, I asked him if he used a 22 caliber weapon. Morphew didn't know yet that they had found a dark cap in the dryer and a 22 cartridge could allegedly fire this dark. And Barry did say, yes, he owns a 22. So here we go. We don't know what's true or not. In terms of this, we'll just have to wait. But here are all the rest of the court transcripts that I recorded previously. So we'll be up to date on everything. We will be caught up on everything for day one and day two. It'll start off with about seven minutes from August 9th, 2021. And then the rest, the bulk of this video is everything I read from August 10th, 2021. I didn't read the entire thing. It would have been huge, but I read the bulk of it. In this upcoming portion, you'll hear all about Barry liking to listen to true crime in his truck as he, you know, drove around the place. Stuff like forensic files. These are recordings they're talking about in court caught on Suzanne's spy pin. So she must have had the spy pin in Barry's truck. We won't hear those recordings yet. Unfortunately, they haven't released them, but we will hear about Suzanne and Barry arguing over money, what Suzanne could and couldn't wear, which was not appropriate as they say coming up, and the fact that Suzanne wanted her inheritance money back from Barry. So mainly superstar FBI guy Johnny Grusing was on the stand August 10th, 2021. He talks in detail all about the locations of Barry's Ford F-350 and his cell phone movements during the critical time when Suzanne went missing and how it went into airplane mode right around the time she stopped communicating with the world. It was suspicious that it went into airplane mode when it did for so many hours, when it came back and went back into airplane mode. But then Barry's attorney, Drew Nielsen, she throws confusion into the mix during her cross-examination because she analyzed the data differently than the way Johnny Grusing analyzed the data. At one point, you're gonna hear me laughing when Johnny Grusing, he seems so lovable and affable. And anyway, he's, he tells Drew, he tells the court, I have no idea what she's talking about because there's so much, you'll hear it from the transcript. It gets confusing. That's why I'm glad I didn't go ahead and spend hundreds more dollars. I mean, 
Day one and day two were $321, so I'm glad I didn't spend another $321 or more to get days three and four of Barry's preliminary hearing court transcripts. Those are the days they went over the mind-numbing DNA analysis. You know, the partial DNA, all that stuff. It just throws people into as much confusion as the jury members of the O.J. Simpson trial way back then when DNA was a new thing. It's still confusing people. And that's why I got so angry and frustrated, kind of likening those two cases in a way. Well, when Barry Morphew's charges were dropped, I was afraid that Suzanne Morphew, she would have to maybe wait for justice, even though maybe they're not waiting, they're in heaven now, but all of us would have to wait to see justice for Suzanne Morphew, just like the perpetrators of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman's murder. You know, that perpetrator, we won't get justice until maybe they meet their maker, sometimes justice doesn't come while we're here on earth and through the court process. Now that they have Suzanne's remains, and can you imagine if, and this is a big if, we don't know. I'm in the camp right now of I don't know. I don't know if this rifle found has anything to do with Suzanne Morphew or a different case or either way, it's got to be helpful. I don't understand why when a person comes out with new information, sometimes they are just immediately attacked by certain folks and they're called a liar and you this and you clickbaiter and we just don't know. I mean, I did my due diligence calling Sawatch County. Couldn't get information from the valid sources, which makes sense. It's still under investigation. He couldn't confirm or deny that the rifle was even turned in. So all we have is this report, which could potentially be true. Can you imagine if it is related to Suzanne Morphew's case? Who knows? If it is, maybe CBI might feel like, oh, we have a little egg on our face because we didn't look that far. But they shouldn't feel that way, no matter what. You know, volunteer search and rescue, firemen, police, whomever volunteer people, there's still out there another set of hands and eyes helping. I understand there are people out there who, you know, involve themselves in crimes and plant evidence and all that, but I'm not sensing that this guy is necessarily one of those people. He looks like he's trying to help the case. So that's why I kind of sat on this and I kept thinking about it and I could not get it out of my mind, but imagine if it is related to Suzanne's case, if they're able to find anything from her remains that indicate gunshot wounds or and you know the striations and ballistics and everything they can tell so much about where it might fit with this weapon who knows i'm saying all this to say hopefully the next video i make about suzanne morphew is an arrest i just want to know that the correct perpetrator is arrested and eventually convicted so i did my best to confirm it you know take it with a grain of salt i think we just have to wait something's you just have to wait and see. If one day there is an arrest in the Suzanne Morphew case, if they're able to present the evidence of the weapon used, and if this Italian-made silver-type rifle turns up, then we'll know, oh yeah, it probably was true. And if not, then we'll know then. So I'm just firmly in the middle here, just presenting what's been going on in the Suzanne Morphew case online, and hopefully the next video about her will be an arrest. So listen to all this court transcript coming up. That's all the rest of it. I just dumped it in the rest of this video. That's everything I could find that I previously recorded from 2021. And then we'll just pray in Jesus' name for justice. Thank you so much. Subscribe to Plunder. Let's talk about Suzanne Morphew's spy pen recordings and Barry Morphew's investment in silver. All the things we are learning from the court transcripts that I ordered. Asking questions for the prosecution for the plaintiff is Mr. Jeffrey Lindsay. Answering questions is FBI agent Ken Harris. I'm allowed to reference portions of the transcript, so I'm starting at page 121 of Barry Morphew's August 9th, 2021 appearance, his literal court transcript. Scripts. Question. Now, in November of 2020, Agent Harris, were you alerted to a potential spy pen? Yes. And what was what was the the part of the spy pen that became not what's on the spy pen, but what part of it became relevant to the victimology aspect of your investigation? So, the various recording files, anything where Suzanne was on there or anybody else that was communicating. So, we were looking at through the recordings just to see 
see what was captured. And did you listen to the files, or at least try to listen to the files that were contained on the spy pen? Yes. Before we get too in-depth about Suzanne, was there some recordings on there of some blogs or different kind of stations? that you heard? So there were. There were a couple of different recordings. One appears to be the pen inside of Barry Morphew's truck as he's driving, as far as we can tell. In that context, you can mostly hear what we presume to be the truck radio, and the truck radio is playing episodes of, there's some news clips, and then there's portions of forensic files talking about various criminal cases and the forensic details about those criminal cases as he's driving. Without going into really huge details of those recordings. Could you tell roundabout when those were recorded? The files themselves don't have dates, but sometimes what's captured on the recording would have dates. I believe there's something in one of the news reports that puts them in, I don't remember this for sure, March or sorry, February or March maybe, 2020? 2020, yes. Was there a recording about somebody going missing while bike riding? Yes. Now, Let's jump back to the other part of the recordings that became relevant to the victimology. Can you tell the court about those recordings and how that became relevant to your investigation? Yes. So there were a couple of recordings. There was a recording that starts in the truck and then at some point Suzanne gets in the truck. Most of these recordings, it doesn't appear from what we can tell that Suzanne attempted on purpose to record some of these. Some of them she did, but the truck noise makes it very difficult to hear who is talking and what is being said, but you can hear a little bit of their conversation as well as them beginning to argue about some things related to money. Suzanne was asking about being paid back. At some point she talks about, it sounds like she's accusing Barry of telling her what she can do and what she can wear and what she's allowed to do. And she's trying to say that that's not legitimate. That's in one recording. There's another recording that appears to be Suzanne and her best friend, Sheila. In February, you can hear the, it would be the Super Bowl. I think it was February 4th, but you can hear the Super Bowl in the background and two females. And it appears to be the trip where Suzanne and Sheila visited each other in Florida in February. Then there's also another recording that's five hours in length and about... I forget where it is, about 30 minutes in the conversation is captured in which Suzanne is speaking to somebody that she calls Jeff and appears to be in a romantic relationship with. Part of the victimology, and I'm going to jump back here to the middle part of that, the recordings about the money. As a victimology aspect, did you try to determine if Suzanne was gainfully employed? I mean, it would be part of the victimology questionnaire just to ask, you know, what's the state of her relationship, her marriage, where does the money come from? Is it, is it something that's an issue? Is it not? So there are money questions in victimology. Yes. What was the source of her income? She had not been employed full time since she'd been a school teacher, I believe in Indiana. So she was raising her daughters. And as far as getting paid back, did you sort of, through the course of the investigation and looking through the victimology, come to understand what she was referring to? We think so, yes. She had money that was an inheritance from her mother, Adrian, and her grandmother, Helen, that she had received and that was, it was used in some way in the purchase of the house as well as possibly in Barry's investment in silver. You mentioned the house, Agent Harris. You're talking about the house there on Puma Path? Yes, yeah, sorry, the house on Puma Path. Okay, now let's jump in. You said that there was a recording where Suzanne inadvertently recorded herself speaking to another individual? Yes. And were you given any information in that recording as to who that individual was? There was a couple of different details. The person seemed to talk about Michigan. These are from my recollection talking about driving, I think, on Highway 75. There were some names that were given talking about what sounded like both the Morpheus kids and possibly this Jeff's kids. So she used the name Jeff twice and he was talking about being on a business trip in, again, Michigan. Several other details like that, but not a lot that gave anything specific to identify him. Was this an important part of the investigation that you're starting to realize that, hey, there's somebody out there we don't know about? Yes. Did you make efforts to try and determine 
who this Jeff person is? Correct. And did you eventually do so? Yes. That's where I'll end this portion because I learned a little bit more than what I knew even following this case so passionately and in depth. I knew Suzanne had invested money into the Puma Path home. I, I did not know that Barry potentially had taken some of that money and invested it in silver. So I wonder what happened with that. It sounds like Suzanne was attempting to get her just due and part of the money she put into the home and probably if they'll potentially cover any money that Barry borrowed from Jean, Suzanne's dying father. We'll see, I'm still going through hundreds and hundreds of pages and I am allowed to reference these. So I'm just picking out portions of the transcript that are the most interesting, where we can learn new things as we await September 17th. Let's close with 2 Timothy 1 13 through 14. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Stay tuned. I will continue reading through all of day one and day two, and I'll pull out the interesting portions to reference, especially those potentially that we didn't see covered by journalists who weren't able to tweet about some of these things. As always, thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned. Subscribe to Plunder. Day 2. Barry Morphew's Preliminary Hearing. August 10th. Judge Murphy. Back on the record. Mr. Morphew and his counsel are present. Mr. Lindsay for the people. Who is your next witness? Mr. Lindsay. Agent John. Former FBI agent Jonathan Grusing. Judge Murphy, if you will come up towards me and raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm under penalty of of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the whole truth? Witness, yes I do. Whereupon Jonathan Grusing was duly sworn. Judge, okay sir, if you could have a seat there, you can remove your mask, state your name, and spell your last name for me. Witness, my name is Jonathan Grusing, G-R-U-S-I-N-G. Direct examination by Mr. Lindsay. Good morning, sir. Morning. Up until about a week ago, were you an FBI agent? I was. What happened? I retired from the FBI and started a new job two days later. No rest for the weary, right? Correct. Tell me about your law enforcement career. So I started with the FBI in September of 1996. I was assigned to the Denver office. I first worked terrorism matters until October of 1998. And then from October 98 until I retired at the end of July, I was primarily assigned to violent crime matters. As such, do you or does the FBI offer assistance to local law enforcement agencies on violent crime and investigations such as this one? Yes. And how did that happen? How did it come about that the FBI got involved with the murder and disappearance of Suzanne Morphew? So when a smaller jurisdiction has a case and they require assistance and they reach out to the FBI, then our administrators determine who from the FBI will go assist in that matter. Since I'd had a lot of experience working missing person cases and nobody homicides, they asked me to work this case. Before we get into the facts of this case, you said you've done a number of missing body, missing persons, no body homicides. Yes, and another facet besides my experience is at the time I was the behavioral analysis unit coordinator, so Chafee County and CBI wanted to bring in what's called BAU, the behavioral analysis unit in quickly to help figure out how to approach Barry Morphew in his interviews. How many nobody homicides have you worked? Ones that have either resulted in prosecution or arrest, about four. And then you just finished up on the Dylan Redwine case, did you not? Yes. 
so that would make five, because that was a nobody to start with. Agent Harris, when he testified yesterday, talked about victimology, and that was why you and him started working on this case. Is that a fair statement? That is, and is there a different way that you look at these cases rather than just a detective otherwise would look at a case? That is correct. Yes, I, starting in 2006, I received a lot of training from the Behavioral Analysis Unit unit. And when a person goes missing, it's the FBI's behavioral analysis role. If you don't have the subject identified, you will look at the victim and the location, form basically a triangle, and you learn all you can about the location, you learn all you can about the victim, and hopefully that will eventually point you towards the person responsible. Definitely more than just the facts type of police work. It's different, yes. So let's talk about some of the things you did on this case. But before I ask those, have you met Barry Morphew? I have. You interviewed him a number of times. Yes. You recognize him in the courtroom today? I do. He's sitting at the defense table wearing a coat tie and a beige colored shirt. Thank you. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the research you all did into the cell phones. When you're doing this victimology piece, is that part of the trying to figure out what leads up to this and going backwards in time? So my research into cell phones was less the victimology piece and more of the experience. When I got a call to help, I asked Chafee and CBI what they needed. Barry's phone had been, a search warrant had been served on Barry's phone and the results were sitting at our computer lab and that had not been analyzed. My understanding was that at the time that Mr. Morphew had been in Broomfield around the time of Suzanne's disappearance and investigators really wanted to know from his phone what his locations were during that May 10th time frame. Do you also look at sort of the correspondence between Mr. Morphew and Ms. Morphew or anybody else that's on his phone? Yes, and we look for things that are there and things that are not there, like things he would delete would be of interest. Time periods when he does not use the phone would be of interest. So that was my first order of business was to find out the status of the review of search warrant on his phone and then see where he was on May 9th and 10th. Are you familiar with the term telematics? I am now. So, you did the deep dive. Can you tell us what it is? So, another search warrant had been served on Barry Morphew's Ford F-350, and technical agents, I don't know exactly who, were able to pull from the computer chip of the truck all of the truck's activity that was available to them. There were gaps in the information, but it, the results of that warrant, generated a 626-page report that had not been analyzed either. So it was pretty difficult to read because it was in different sections. It had sections like when the door opened, when the door closed, when the brake lights came on, when they went off, the odometer, they were all in different, basically, sections. So around the same time, I got the Phone, I got the telematics from his truck and compared them two off of each other to see if they would corroborate the information. Let's talk about the 600 page report. Were you able to break that down and sort of come up with an idea as to what Mr. Morphew was doing? Well, probably go back before May 9th, but let's focus on May 9th and May 10th. Did you get assistance from anybody in looking at this and going over that? I did. I spoke with people from our computer lab, and for the cell phone piece, I spoke with our cell phone expert, Kevin Hoyland. Let's talk about the day of May 9th, 2020. Did you look at where Mr. Morphew was, according to the telematics of his truck, in the sort of early afternoon hours? Yes. What were you able to find? By the time I got these telematics and the phone, Barry Morphew had given a couple of interviews to law enforcement already, so I had an idea of his statements. At the same time, I was looking at these. I was working with the Behavior Analysis Unit on upcoming interviews of Barry with the CBI agents Joe Cahill and Derek Graham. So I had really three things going. What Barry had said, what his phone was 
showing and then what his truck was showing and the phone and the truck were correlating with what Barry said in the morning that he left his residence on Saturday, May 9th, went to what we call the 105 property to do some work in the morning. Then he went to what we call the Tailwinds property to do some work until about 11.30 or so. Then he returned to the residence for lunch. What time do you recall roughly that was? I recall him getting to the house around 11.30 and there was some discussion in some parts of the interview that that was the time he did what? So from Barry's interview, he said that he came home and had veggie soup with Suzanne and they sat in the sun for a while. What was the next step in the research of his truck and phone? There were some things that I didn't piece together until much later, but in my initial review, I found that he called Suzanne when he was leaving the residence on Highway 50 a little after 1.30. He also called who he had on his phone as Tim Backo, and then he called Justin Cribari. Then he called Justin Cribari, and then he called Justin Cribari. So he was home from about 11.30 to 1.30, a little after. It looks like he leaves, makes those phone calls, and then he heads back to meet with Justin Cribari to change the blade on his bobcat. He's also in communication with a guy we identified later as Tim KLCO, although it's spelled KLCO, about buying a backhoe attachment. From the interview with Mr. KLCO, Barry and he had talked in like October of 2019 about him getting a backhoe attachment, but there had been no communication between then and May 9th. So they communicate Mr. KLCO was out of town. Barry's truck drives around the area where Tim had his backhoe attachment. His phone is also there, but he does not purchase the attachment because Mr. KLCO is not in town. Then Barry meets quickly with a gym owner to look at a plot of land, possibly a new job for him. Then he comes back home and he's texting and calling Suzanne as he returns to the residence. What time does he get there roughly? He gets to the residence at just before 2.44 p.m. How does that jibe with what FBI agents know that Suzanne's doing? So again, some of these pieces didn't come until later, but we later figured out that Suzanne was sunbathing at that time and taking pictures of herself and sending them to Jeff Libler. Okay, Ms. Nielsen, was there a foundation or clarification as to the time frame on that, Your Honor? Judge, so you just answered that question right after you said Mr. Morphew got home at 2.44. So are you going backwards from 2.44 as far as the sunbathing? Witness, yes, Your Honor. So, Judge and Witness, I thought that was the question of what she was doing at the time. Judge, then he got home. Witness. Correct. Judge. Yeah, does that help, Ms. Nielsen? Ms. Nielsen. Well, Your Honor, I think he's saying that that took place before, so I'm asking for clarification of the timing. I suppose I can bring it out, but I think it's unclear what that time frame is. Witness. I'm happy to go through that minute by minute if you want me to. Judge. That's fine with me. Mr. Lindsay. Well, we did it with Agent Harris already, Judge. Judge. So I'd say save that for your cross-examination if need be. I think we're clear that he's testifying that at the time Mr. Morphew got home, that's what Ms. Morphew was doing. Witness, a few minutes before, yes. I don't have it at 2.44 she was sunbathing. I have minutes before that when she last posted would have been about 2.11 when she said, quote, I'm on WhatsApp, end quote, to Jeff Libler and she had taken a photo of herself prior to that. Does that help? Mr. Lynn May I approach with what's been marked as People's 59? Mr. Lindsay, do you recognize that, sir? I do. What is it? That is a picture recovered from a search warrant of Suzanne's LinkedIn account. And do you know, you said this was sent to Mr. Libler. Do you know what time it was sent? I believe it was 2.03 p.m. And the date was? It was May 9th. 
Is that a fair and accurate copy of that image that you were able to get off of Ms. Morphew's iPhone account? Yes, Mr. Lindsay, move for admission of 59. Ms. Nielsen, no objection. Judge, 59 is admitted. Mr. Lindsay, can we publish it, Judge? Judge, that's fine, Mr. Lindsay. Let's focus on this 244 return. That's when he comes back after your testimony was doing the bobcat, the blade, that kind of stuff the 105 property. Let's focus in on that. What happened with the truck on 244? So the truck was at the residence and the it goes into park. I believe it was 243 59 seconds p.m. and the driver door opens. What happened with his phone at that time? From 244 until 247 p.m. his phone appears to move around the outside of the house almost in a pattern. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What I did was since it wasn't plotting the same coordinate, I would take the coordinate from the phone record, plug it into Google Earth, and then zoom in to see where it would be. Because of the poor cell coverage at the residence, I could not tell, and I'm not a cell phone expert, on whether it was in the same place or just bouncing around outside the house, so where there was movement or not. I could not confirm that until Mr. Morphew confirmed it for me. Tell us about that. So, when Agent Harris and I, through our process of speaking with Mr. Morphew, we were disclosing parts of our evidence with him to figure out what happened to Suzanne. I did disclose to him that it looked like his cell phone from 244 to 247 was moving around outside of the house. I believe this was the February 28th interview. He says, I shoot chipmunks. I said, well, tell me what that means. He goes, I'm running around the house shooting chipmunks. And I'm paraphrasing at this time because it's a back and forth. He said, I've shot 85 chipmunks. I asked him if he used a 22 caliber. At that point, I had known and I had not disclosed to Mr. Morphew yet that we found a tranquilizer dart cap in the dryer. And I knew from Chafee County that a 22 cartridge would fire. So when he was talking about running around the outside of the house, I asked him if it was a 22 that he used and he said, yes, it was. So from 244 to 247, that's when you have the phone bouncing around the exterior of the house. What happens to his phone at 247, his phone goes into airplane mode. Did agents look and see if there was any sort of contact or information that Ms. Morphew was exchanging at that time with anybody at 247? Yes, we looked at her LinkedIn account and she continued to get messages from Jeff Libler and she did not respond to those messages. He was asking how her weather was, questions like that. Let's now talk about 2.44 to 4.44 p.m. and the telematics of the truck. What happened at 4.44 p.m.? So, there was movement of the truck from 2.44 to 4.44, and at 4.44 p.m., the truck shifts to neutral, goes to park, the driver door closes, and the driver door opens. So we're going to come back and say, did you ask Barry about this eventually? but let's just get all this information out there for the time being. Sure. What happened at 5.33 p.m.? At 5.33 p.m., there was an activity on the truck that said power remove, system reboot, and Agent Harris and I have asked our technical agents to look at it, even our agents in Quantico at our lab, and they cannot explain what caused this action to happen. Any other telematics activity up and until 9.24? Yes, intermittently, driver doors would open and close, parking lights would come on and off. There would be anywhere from a 40-minute gap to an hour gap. But at 925, the gear shift goes from park to reverse. And does the car move? It does. It moves backwards through the driveway about 96 feet. We have at 925, how long did the opening and closing of the doors last? This was the first time I saw passenger doors open and close, and that happened until 9.52 p.m. Driver doors and passenger doors opening and closing. Any other telematic activity until 3.25 a.m. on May 10th? 
No. Anything happen with Barry's phone that night? Does it come out of airplane mode at some time? It does at 10.17 p.m. Were you able to look at the GPS and figure out where the phone was? Yes, the phone was at the residence or appeared to be and it marked a lot of activity at the residence in speaking with the cell phone experts. It looks like even though it's jumping around that it's stationary there and that matches with Barry's statements that he said he and Suzanne put their phones aside that night. Any telematics that occur early morning around 3.25 a.m.? Yes. What happened? You have driver doors opening and closing. It's in the same location at the edge of their driveway from 3.25 until 3.52 a.m. So, 3.58 to 4.07 a.m., what's going on with Mr. Morphew's phone? So, if, when I plotted the activity because it showed it away from the resident, it showed almost a straight line of it moving from his residence up to where 2.25 intersects 50. It's close to the area of where the bike was recovered. However, when I ran that past our cell phone experts, he said he could not say the phone was moving. So I just had that as something basically to put in the back of my hat of during that time it was strafing or whatever term they call it, but they couldn't say with certainty that it was actually moving from the residence. So via 225 and Highway 50 is what you were able to plot and determine and then later qualify. Correct. Did you and other agents try to determine where Suzanne's phone last registered a signal? Yes. What were you able to find? It last registered signals quite a ways from the house, but in an arc that was consistent with it not being able to reach a cell tower well. And that was around 4.10. I think the last one was around 4.22 a.m. on May 10th. Any other registers or actions on her phone according to cast information? No. 4.31 p.m. What activity do you note? when you look through the cell phone records and the telematics as happening with Barry. Judge, you said PM. I just want to be clear. Are we still talking about the morning? Mr. Lindsay, I'm sorry, Judge. Yeah, thank you for catching that. Mr. Lindsay, 4.31 a.m. So, 4.31 a.m. on May 10th, his phone goes back into airplane mode and it's at the residence. How long is it in airplane mode? It is until 5.37 a.m. when he is approximately turning in Buena Vista heading towards Broomfield. Ms. Nielsen, Judge, I'm going to object to the characterization that it was in airplane mode. I believe Mr. Grusing has written that it appeared to be in airplane mode. Judge, so maybe we could go back to that testimony. You said 431 the phone goes into airplane mode and it's located at the house. Do I have that right? Yes. So? So when I'm examining the cell phone records and I believe we gave the defense a copy of this, you can look at the phone functions and then Google airplane mode and it will come up how many times the phone was in airplane mode. Judge Murphy. So how did you determine it went into airplane mode at 431? His phone records show airplane mode 4.31 a.m. Judge, so I'm not sure if that was a foundation objection. Miss Nielsen, Your Honor, I'll clear it up on cross. Mr. Lindsay, residence at 4.31, BV at 5.37 a.m. Correct. Any other phone activity around that time? Not between those two times. How about after it comes back online? Once his phone comes back online, I'm able to track the phone intermittently as it heads to Broomfield. I'm not able to see the telematics of the truck. However, and our, I think this truck activity is fairly new, at least to the people I was talking with, so they could not tell if that 533 reboot had interfered with the activity or it was the mountains. So we don't know at this point, or at least I don't. Then I could see the phone come up to Denver and eventually make it up to an RTD bus stop in Broomfield. Any text messages at 5.38 a.m.? Yes. He texted his mom, Shirley, Happy Mother's Day. Any text messages to Suzanne Morphew at that time? Not at that time. Was there one later that morning? Yes. What time was it and what was the text message? So the text message was, Happy Mother's Day, I love you. 
Let me get the time, 6.56 a.m. Were you able to determine where that was sent from? Yes, he was near Bailey, Colorado. Eventually, did the telematics come back online and be able to look at that information? Yes. When did that happen? Just after 8, 8, 10 a.m. when his phone was also near that bus stop in Broomfield on Highway 36. I'm going to approach with 28 through 55. Can you review those exhibits? What are people's 28 through 55? They are they include both surveillance photos and some Google Earth photos that depict Barry Morphew's activity on May 10th in Broomfield. Based on what? Based upon my review of telematics and cell phone activity and then law enforcement going out and collecting video. Let me add to that. Law enforcement had already gone to the Broomfield Hotel and collected most of that video, but they were looking for other places that Barry had stopped during that time. You testify that the phone shows up at a bus stop in Broomfield and People's 28. What is that? That is a Google Earth image of when I zoom in and do street view based upon that coordinate. And why is this photo taken? Because the Ford F-350 doors opened and closed. Not just the driver's door but the passenger door as well. So I was curious as to why. If you see in the picture there's a trash can about 20 to 30 feet. Agent Harris and I actually went to this site and we didn't know if Barry threw something away at this site. Was there ever a discussion about that? Yes. With who? With Barry. What was the discussion? He said he did throw things away at this site but could not recall what they were. Does that appear to be consistent with the telematics of the doors opening and closing? Yes, he would have time with the passenger door opening and closing like it would say passenger door opened at 8 10 36 a.m. and then passenger door closed at 8 12 13 a.m. so it took about a minute and a half and that trash can is only 10 to 15 steps away from where the truck was parked so was that the only trash run that day? No, we refer to that as trash run number one. Mr. Lindsay, I'd move for admission of 28. Ms. Nielsen, no objection. Judge Murphy, 28 is admitted and you may publish. Mr. Lindsay, there's a remote there. If you could point out for the court where the trash receptacle is, right there, the truck telematics, they were actually more detailed and more accurate we found than even the phone telematics. So it would have his vehicle parked about right here. Were you able to trace Mr. Morphew with the phone and the telematics again? Yes. What were you able to find out? I was able to find that he parked on the south side of the hotel at the Holiday Inn Express and passenger doors again opened and closed a couple of times before he actually checked into the hotel. You have an image in this stack of exhibits 29. Do you see that in front of you? I do. What is that? That side of the hotel and it has a yellow GPS pinpoint where the four telematics were hitting for that time period and it was about 8.12 a.m. to almost 8.20 a.m. Did you ask Ask Mr. Morphew if he actually parked there? I did. What did he say? He said he parked there because he hoped someone would come out and he could go in the hotel before checking in and get a free breakfast. People's 29, a fair and accurate depiction of where his truck was located? They do. Mr. Lindsay, move for admission of 29 and publish. Ms. Nielsen, no objection. Judge Murphy, 29 is admitted. You may. Mr. Lindsay, rather than ask foundation questions of all these, I'm going to ask that the foundation questions for 30 through 58 and that way we don't have to go back each time and publish and admit. Judge Ms. Nielsen? Ms. Nielsen. Your Honor, the only problem is I don't have a copy of what he has so I can't label it. So if I could get a copy I have no problem with the foundation and admission. I just I need to be able to identify the exhibits and I haven't been provided a copy. Judge Murphy. Are they in a form 
that they can reference? Are the photos together in the Discovery somewhere? Mr. Lindsay, they're all in Discovery. They've been provided in Discovery. They've also been identified as exhibits according to the court's order previously. It's not a surprise to them. Judge Murphy, no, I don't think that's what they're saying. I think it would just be easier if they had a copy. It's not a big deal. We can get you a black and white copy. Ms. Nielsen, that would be great. There's no exhibit numbers. They're just pages. Judge Murphy, are they not numbered? Witness, they are on what I'm seeing. Mr. Lindsay, they're not numbered on the copy I have, but they are in order that I'm going through them with Agent Grusin. Ms. Nielsen, so they need to be numbered when we get the copy. Mr. Lindsay, what activity happened at this hotel? So we don't know what happened here because video was not collected on the south side. So we could not see what he was doing. Video was collected on basically all the other sides of the hotel, but not this one. Was there anything that happened in relation to a second trash run? This was what we referred to as trash run two, because there is a trash can here, and based upon the passenger door opening and closing, and the activity he just had at RTD, we thought this was another trash run. Mr. Morphew confirmed that in interviews. He said he could not recall if he threw stuff away what it would be, but he does recall throwing stuff away. Yes. Eventually, did you get the video of the hotel and try and determine how those matched Mr. Morphew's phone? Yes, I did. And what was the variance between the video of the hotel and Mr. Morphew's phone? The video was about 51 minutes fast. What time did Mr. Morphew enter the hotel? I have him driving around front at about 8.25 and the door is opening. So then he comes in. Again, we were having to go back and forth with the video, but we have him walking in at about 8.25 and actually then taking another trip to his room at 8.38. People's 30 demonstrate that location Yes, Mr. Lindsay. I'm not sure if the court actually said we could do it this way, but I was hoping again to have everything admitted and then publish Ms. Nielsen. No objection now that I have the copies. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. If we could publish 30, please. Can you show us what we're looking at here? That is where he was parked during what we call trash run number two, and then he drove around front here and checked in. If you look at 31, you mentioned he went into the hotel around 825? Yes. Look at 31. Does that show that? It does. We can see Mr. Morphew walking through the double doors there. Yes. What does he have in his hand? Just something small. I wasn't able to determine that. What happened next? He checked in and then the next item of interest or surveillance photos of interest were him carrying multiple items to his room. What does it appear he has in his hand? Well, he's wearing a backpack and a long sleeved shirt and in his left hand, he's carrying what looks like hiking boots, a teal colored top, possibly. We weren't able to confirm that for sure, Ms. Nielsen. Judge, I'm going to ask him not to speculate. If he doesn't know what something is, he shouldn't be permitted to identify it as such. Judge Murphy, so you said it was a top and then quickly backtracked that you witness. It's a piece of clothing would probably be a better way to put it. Judge, okay, thanks. And then another darker black, what looks like a piece of clothing. We couldn't tell for sure. And then a bag. We couldn't tell what was inside the bag. Mr. Lindsay, is there then a text to Ms. Morphew? Yes, he texts at 8.41 a.m. I made it to Broomfield. Call me when you get a chance. At any point in time up to now, had Mr. Morphew phoned Suzanne Morphew? He had not. What happens next? He stayed in his room for about an hour and then he exited his room. He's not wearing the long sleeved shirts and his items of clothing have been rearranged along with a different trash bag or not trash bag. At this point, it's just a bag. 
Those boots appear to be the same boots that he had when he went in about an hour prior? Yes, they do. What else is distinctive about this picture? Well, if I could go back to the boots, Agent Harris and I did interview Barry about these boots and why he would take them into his room and come back out. I didn't know if you wanted me to address that. Why don't you please? He said that they had some holes in them, but that the laces were good. So he took them to his room, took the laces out to save the laces, and then he was going to take the boots to throw them away. What's the next event based on surveillance? As he's walking out of the elevators, we could see that one of the bags appeared to be a target bag, which we could not see when he entered the hotel. What time was this? The hotel timestamp was 9.07, so it would be about 10.10 or so. Was he wearing a different shirt? Yes, the same one he was wearing as he left his room. Did he then go to his truck and return empty-handed to the hotel room? He did. Is that people's 34? That's 35 when he's walking back empty-handed. What happens next? He's barely in his room for a minute or two and then he turns back around and walks to his truck. I circled that one because I was also looking at what time the door opens on telematics and comparing that with the video just to make sure we're square. Were you able to look at his phone location and truck telematics to kind of figure out what happens from this Holiday Inn Express hotel? Yes, it looks like he drives up and around what we refer to as the Via Vara worksite. Is that depicted in People's 38? Yes. I don't see from telematics that his truck ever goes into park, but it does look like he drives up and around what is eventually called the Broomfield Wall, which he was there to build, and it was up in this area. He had worked on that in 2019 with his crew, and this task was supposedly to have to redo the wall because it needed to be moved. You continue to monitor his phone? Yes. It looks like he next goes to a McDonald's parking lot in Broomfield. Are you able to capture video from that? Yes. CBI was able to capture video from a bank ATM that was across the parking lot. Does People's 39 depict the McDonald's? Yes. This is where his truck was parked. You'll eventually see him walking here, placing trash in the trash can. The ATM camera was back in here behind these trees, so it would have been difficult for him to see. If we could look at People's 40, is this the one you just described? Yes, it is. If you could look at the far right one, it appears like, can you tell us what you observed there? Barry is bending over and his right arm is, it appears to be pushing trash down into the trash can. So what number are we on now as far as the trash runs? This would be number three. Do you talk to him about this video? We did, and we also showed him. There's not one in here, but in this series. But after this, he actually pushes with both hands and leans into the trash can. What does he say? Why is he doing that? So, to clarify, he makes one run around here, puts a small item which we could not determine. We asked Barry what this was and he said he did not recall. Then he walks back around to the truck. He spends about a minute there, pulls something else out, very small, and then walks back around and pushes that item down with both hands. Agent Harris and I spoke with him about this. CBI actually knew about this during the end part of their interviews. Barry, I think, told them on July 8th that it was probably just wrappers from his truck. Agent Harris and I showed him as best we could. We said we couldn't see the object. What is that? And he said he did not recall. What were you able to determine happened next? From there, he went to a men's warehouse parking lot that is not far from this location. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't find this until later. He went to, it looks like he went to a car wash around the corner briefly. I didn't see this until much later, but Barry did corroborate this with CBI agents and said he might have washed off his windshield at a gas station. The telematics didn't pick it up, but his phone maybe for two or three minutes was there. But then he goes 
goes from there to a parking lot and the largest store close to where the telematics and phone were placing him was men's warehouse. Is that 41? Yes. Can you tell us why these things are identified? Yes. I spoke with CBI about this when I saw this one because this, out of all five stops, this one had the most telematic activity and he spent the longest time here. He spent 40 minutes here and his passenger doors, driver doors were opening and closing for extended periods of time. To give you an example, the driver door would open at 10.52 and then not close until 10.54.47. Then parking lights would go on and off for about four or five minutes. The passenger door would close at 11.14. So he spent 40 minutes in this lot and CBI did canvas and all these businesses around had no video. So I went out there myself later just to look around and see if there was even periphery video. Agent Harris went with me on another trip and we could not find video here. Why do you have an arrow marking the dumpster area on there? Because trash run number five is similar in that Barry parked a ways away from a dumpster took large items and walked across the parking lot to a dumpster. We do have that on film. For Trash Run 5, for Trash Run 5. Did you ask him about this particular stop? Yes. Did he say he threw anything away? He said he did throw items away. Did he tell you what they were? He did not. I think Agent Harris and I did approximately 10 interviews of Barry and the only thing that we could get him to move on on what he threw away were was his tranquilizer materials from the garage. What did he tell you about that? He said that he was cleaning off his workbench and that he might have thrown those away when he went to Broomfield. What happens next? So Barry returned to the hotel, parked, and he took a large notebook with papers into the hotel room. So 43 and 44, what do those show? Him coming into the room with a notebook. As you can see, the papers are a little more disheveled than in 44 when he comes back out of the room. They seem to be a little more neatly placed. The other difference between 43 and 44 is he has changed shirts from a dark short sleeve shirt to a light colored short sleeve shirt. Were you able to determine where he went from there? Yes. He went to the Via Vera work site. Is that depicted in 45? Yes. It looks like he had 11 to 15 minutes to do some work, which would be consistent with his statements to CBI that he removed a couple of blocks from the retaining wall. Did you ever learn what was the problem with the retaining wall? Yes. So I spoke with Terry Lott and they had subcontracted EA Outdoors based out of Indianapolis and a friend of Barry's named Tony Miller reached out to Barry in 2019 to build this wall. Then, was it done correctly? Well, it was done correctly, but then they wanted it moved back and they wanted certain things done after it was built. So he was having to redo the wall. The other thing they told me is that both Tony Miller from EA Outdoors and Barry, who did the initial project, should know you can't work on Sunday because that's against city code for Broomfield. There's images of Mr. Morphew's truck and he's got a skid steer on that trailer. Any information that it was taken to Broomfield, that bobcat? No, it was not taken to Broomfield. How long was Mr. Morphew at this work site? About 20 minutes and about in park around 11.15. At this point, is there any phone activity? Yes. At 12.06 p.m., he called his daughter, Mallory. Did he call Miss Morphew at that time? He did not. At some point or another, does Mr. Morphew reach out to his neighbors? He does. When does that happen? Not until much later. So, at 3.30, Barry texted Suzanne to call him. Then, it's not until 5.15 that he receives a call from his neighbor, Jean Ritter. Did Mr. Morphew go back to the hotel around 12.27? Yes. What do we see in the parking lot video from that? Yeah, we can. The hotel video does record this trash run number five as well as the telematics 
put him back there at the hotel as well. 47, what are we looking at there? We're looking at Mr. Morphew. He has already taken two bags from his truck and placed them by the curb. This is the front entrance lobby of the hotel here. Did you put that red circle there? I did. Any idea what he's got there? We're eventually able to see a little more as he moves those items across the lot. And you will eventually see him take those all the way through to a dumpster that's on the side. But it looks like a larger trash bag. The black item appears to be a container for either a tree or a shrub. And then there's a coat that appears to be camouflage colored. 48, he leaves the items by the curb and walks back to his truck. Because it's off camera, we could not see what he did. 49, he's now returned to the truck. We could not determine if he had something else in his hand, but he picks up the bags and then starts walking. That's the bag in his right hand. Just for context, can you tell us what happens once he gets all those items in his hands? Yeah, he's facing this direction and he's about to walk. You can't see the dumpster, it's all the way across the lot. His truck would be behind him on the other side of the lobby and the dumpster would be right off screen to the left here. That's Barry carrying the items. 52, please. So the dumpster is behind Barry, and he's walking back to the hotel empty-handed. Did you watch this video up until he gets to the room? Yes. How would you describe that? He's walking in the same posture, slowly with his head down and hands in his pockets. 53, please. So again, the timestamp is off, almost 51 minutes or so. So we're looking at 5.55 p.m. And Barry has been, since he came inside from the dumpster run, in his room since that. I had him entering his room at 12.42 p.m., coming back out at 5.55 p.m. So he has not left his room or the hotel during that time frame. At any point during the time he's in his hotel room, did he reach Suzanne by phone? He did not. Was there a text? Yes, I said earlier at 3.30 p.m. he texted, call me to Suzanne. At 5.15 p.m. Barry received a call from Jean Ritter, so Barry would have been in his room at that time. This conflicted with numerous statements he had given to CBI even very early on. How so? He told agents as early as May 13th that he was at the wall working when Jean Ritter called him and that the reason she called him that he was concerned about Suzanne. He waited for a call and that he left the wall at about 6 p.m. and deposited tools in the lobby for his workers to come and finish the job. The video has him instead in his room while he receives this first call from Gene Ritter and then he gets a second call from Gene at 5.45 p.m. What else is noteworthy about this picture? Well, he's got his backpack on and he again appears to have a different shirt on than the light gray shirt he was wearing before. Did you talk to Mr. Morphew about what he was doing inside of that room? Actually, let me ask a question and then that question. You said for the majority of time he talked to law enforcement. He said he wasn't there. Did you show him this video and ask him what's going on? Yes, Mr. Morphew's statement to us changed significantly from May 11th to law enforcement to April 22nd of 2021. His initial statement to CBI on May 13th was that he was working until 6 p.m. when he got the call. But then when Agent Harris and I would introduce evidence to him, he would change and say, well, Maybe I was only there a short period of time because it wasn't too much work to do. To go through all the statements would be a long time, but he did amend his statement to say he went there, he might have watched Fox News, he might have watched something about a basketball show, but he would not tell us what he was doing in the room from 1242 to 555. Let's move to 54. Can you tell us what we're looking at there? This is him coming back into the hotel, and this was just after 6 p.m. He has a shovel and a rake, I believe in his hand, and other tools. His truck is parked in front, and this is him carrying tools. 
This is the receptionist at the hotel. They have some sort of dialogue which Barry tells us about that he asked if he can place tools there for his workers that are coming. She says that's okay. This is Barry. He's placing tools in the corner. He makes three such trips. 55 please. This is another trip carrying another hand tool. I think he's got both one in his left hand and one in his right hand. Mr. Lindsay, Judge, I'm at a pretty significant stopping point if the court wants to take a break. Judge Murphy, yeah. I think that makes sense, so we'll take a lunch break. We'll start back up again at 1.30. There was a pause in the proceedings at this point from 11.56 a.m. to 1.34 p.m. This will probably be a good breaking point for us to end the video. When we come back for the next portion, we're going to talk about two swiped images that were recovered off of Barry's phone and additional details from Barry's second day of his proof evident presumption great hearing. 1 John 4.16 And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Thank you. Subscribe to Plunder. Judge Murphy, we're back on the record, 21 CR 78, People versus Barry Morphew. Mr. Morphew and his counsel are in the courtroom, and we've got the four representatives from the prosecutor's office. Agent Grusing is still on the stand. Mr. Lindsay? Mr. Lindsay, I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 56, previously admitted. Do you recognize that? I do. There were some questions about how that was obtained. Maybe you could enlighten us as to how it was actually obtained. Sure. Jim Stevens is our examiner at the Rocky Mountain Computer Forensics Lab. And when I spoke with him about Barry's cell phone, he said he was able to recover two swiped images that were, they would look like they were deleted, but they were. Mr. Stevens was able to recover them. This was one of them. He said it was dated May 6th, 10.13 a.m. It was recovered off of Barry's phone? Yes, from Suzanne to Barry. And as you're looking through this case and conducting your investigation, do you then try to follow anything that came after that text? Yes. As you're looking at Mr. Morphew's phone, what do you find? I guess, let's clear up this issue. Are these other images recovered from RMR CFO? There are only two of these swiped images which would look like they're deleted. Separately, Barry's phone had deleted texts. We also had Suzanne's iCloud records where we were able to retrieve some of Barry's messages that weren't on his phone but would show up on her iCloud. So the response to this from Mr. Morphew, we did not have a response besides what was shown from this image and at the bottom it is Barry responding to Suzanne saying that's V. We could not recover anything else from her iCloud or from his phone. Separate from that are their texts that go back and appear to reference that text from Mr. Morphew to Ms. Morphew that were recovered by law enforcement? Yes. Can you talk about those? Yes. These appear to be deleted items from Barry's phone and they are, it's later on that evening and it's talk of suicide from Barry. Do you recall the text, the wording of the text? Yes, I can look those up. The time frame is between 2.43 p.m. to 5 p.m. on May 6th, correct? Yes, and through phone locations, we have him at a work site not far from Tailwinds when he was responding with these messages to Suzanne. Go back to what his response to this I'm done text. They were pretty lengthy texts. If I can summarize, I'll take a few quotes from them. Barry said, I'm sorry things went the way they did. You think I'm a terrible person to hide our accounts. When I'm dead, which won't be long, you guys will be taken care of. If I could control my hurt heart, I think I can overcome your distant unlovingness towards me. Then going to see my savior. And finally, 
This life on earth is a mere, and he spelled mere, M-E-A-R, a mere grain of sand compared to eternity. On my notes, Suzanne did not respond to any of those texts. What actually happens next? So let's talk about May 6th into May 7th. So, from May 6th to May 7th, I don't really have much activity. May 7th, Barry is talking about texting a person about getting a new Ford F-350. It's on order for $80,000. May 7th, also, Barry attempts to call Gene Mormon for the first time in the call records. That is Suzanne's father. Then he's going back and forth with George Davis, a friend of his. Anything on May 6th that didn't seem normal? Was there a text from Mallory to Mr. Morphew? I believe that's the night of May 7th. Mallory Macy and their friend Holly are out on a trip towards Utah and Mallory is sending pictures to both Suzanne and Barry. But I was looking primarily at Barry's phone because I didn't have Suzanne's phone. It's talking about their time together sending photos. Barry is normally responsive. But then later on that evening around 11, she says, I finally got the job. It's a job she's been talking about for a while. There's no response from either Barry or Suzanne that evening. When you look at Suzanne's computer information, do you find anything the morning of May 8th at 7.02 a.m.? I do. What do you find? A computer scientist named Brian Turner called me and he was able to recover from her notes section in her phone that it was last saved at 7.02 a.m. on May 8th. We refer to this as her list of grievances. There's approximately 50 reasons why Suzanne is talking about leaving the marriage. Miss Nielsen, I'm going to object to the characterization. Witness, I'm happy to read Miss Nielsen talking about the grievances, but he shouldn't be characterizing what it is. Judge Murphy, so is it the title of what he's calling it? Because he says we refer to it as Miss Nielsen. But then he said that Suzanne wanted to leave the marriage. That's what Suzanne is thinking at that moment. Judge Murphy, could we just keep our language a little tighter? Witness, okay. Her list of grievances against Barry. Mr. Lindsay, knowing what you know about this case, it does appear that those are directed towards her husband. Correct. For instance, wedding ring. Yes. What do you know about that? Well, there's a couple of different things. We don't know for sure. We spoke with Agent Harris, and I spoke with Sheila. We spoke with other friends of Suzanne, and we even spoke with Barry. We reviewed this list with him to figure out what all these items meant. Wedding ring could mean a wedding ring that he melted down back in Indiana. It could mean he might not be wearing his wedding ring. So I don't know for sure on that one. Another one of them is women on Facebook, good for business. That's women on Facebook. Barry told Suzanne that she would talk to him, that women he had a lot of women on his Facebook and he would justify that it was just good for business. Move to the chase me around the resort and threaten. Took phone. What do you know that to mean? That refers to their time in Mexico when they were at a resort. Ms. Nielsen. Judge, I'm going to object. I don't know what the who is characterizing this. Is it Agent Grusing? Is it whom? Witness. I'll give foundation. Sorry. Judge. Thank you. By Mr. Lindsay. Where did you learn about this information? We talked with Barry Morphew about this one. No one person could answer all of them. So this was in talking with Sheila, in looking at her own records, in talking with Barry and other friends. So that's why I do remember talking with Barry about this one and he confirmed that this was when they were at the resort in Mexico. He did not admit to threatening her. He did admit to trying to take her phone and look at it. Go down. Quote, act like I'm intruding in the garage. End quote. So we spoke with Sheila also about this. I did speak with Barry about this and Barry told me that Suzanne thought he had cameras in the garage but he said he did not. Did you go over these with Mr. Morphew? We did. Did he confirm any of them or all of them? Some of them. Yeah. I would have to look in my report to see exactly what he confirmed and what he didn't. May 8th in the morning, a text that Suzanne sent to her sister, Melinda. Yes, 
9.28 a.m.? Yes, 9.28, Suzanne sent a text to Melinda, quote, it's hard dealing with the harsh abrasiveness and having to show respect. He's also been abusive emotionally and physically. There's so much, end quote. Then it's dot, 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 quote, I went through a period of acceptance and I feel more angry now, anger at what I've allowed. End quote. Did you talk to Melinda about this text? We did. Did she remember getting this text and refer to it? She did. What did she say? She said she didn't really know how to respond. What's our next activity between Mr. Morphew and Barry Morphew? I believe that should be. What's our next activity between Ms. Morphew and Barry Morphew on May 8th in the morning? Suzanne called Barry just after 10. Then Barry called her four times in a row from 10.05 to 10.08 and sent two text messages during that time. Then the longest call that we had started at 10.09 and lasted for 26 minutes and 40 seconds. It was from Suzanne to Barry. Next phone activity is what? At 10.55, Barry texted Suzanne the words, quote, I love you, Suzanne, end quote, and she did not respond. How does that contrast with the text from May 6th? It appears that they were having an argument on Wednesday. Ms. Neal and judge, I'm going to object to what it appears shouldn't be interpreting what's going on. Judge, Mr. Lindsay? Mr. Lindsay. Well, did you talk to Barry about these text messages on May 6th and into May 8th? Yes. What did he tell you about the May 6th text messages? He talked with CBI numerous times before Ken and I spoke with him, but he maintained that Friday morning there was a big text argument, and then by Friday afternoon, everything was okay. That would be May 8th when this I love you text and the phone call was happening. When Agent Harris and I showed him the Wednesday text and that the argument happened, then he said, well, then our Friday argument must have happened Wednesday. Did he tell you anything about his intentions of sending these messages to her? Yes, he said he was just trying to hurt her. May 8th, any correspondence between Mr. Morphew and Ms. Morphew? Yes, primarily text messages. Barry is asking Suzanne to stop by his work site if she can. Did you speak to Mr. Morphew about what this text meant? Yes. What did he tell you? That, and it correlated with what he had said later on, that he wanted her to bring him drinks to his work site. Stop by and see the work he had been doing. What did she say? Suzanne's texts said she's studying. She's going to take a bike ride and asked why. Then eventually from tracking her phone and even finding her Range Rover, she went out to meet Barry near that 105 work site. They actually didn't meet there though. It looks like they met at the Tailwind site and then they got into Suzanne's Range Rover and drove to the store and then to Moonlight Pizza. I neglected to mention one text message. Was there something that she sent to Mr. Mor Morphew at 8.40 a.m. relating to Mr. Morphew's business? Yes. What was that? This is in sequence. It would be after she backed up her grievances and before she texted Melinda. So 8.43 would be to Barry, quote, sorry, I forgot about Rob Nizzle last night, but I will continue to do your invoicing when you need to. Did you talk to Mr. Morphew about this text? I don't remember if we did or not. Anything noteworthy that happens between 8 and 9? Yes, her Facebook codes were reset at 8.50 p.m. And then by 9.04 p.m., people started friending her on Facebook, a lot of her old friends from Indiana. I believe it was 23 people total. Some were here from Colorado, but most of the friends were old friends from Indiana. Men? Out of the 23, I believe 20 were men. And how does that, is there any relation back to the grievance list about women on Facebook? Facebook. Did you talk to Mr. Morphew about that? I spoke with Mr. Morphew about this. We didn't know if this was Barry friending people on Suzanne's phone or Suzanne friending. It was just odd behavior because she did not do this. She wasn't friending really anyone in 2020. And then this is the night before she disappeared. So we did speak with Barry about this. Did he admit that he did this? No, he said he did not do it. May 9th, early morning, 7.35. Any activity on Suzanne's phone or social media? Yes, she and Jeff Libler sent and received 
59 linked in communications to each other that day. At 7.35, does something additional happen? She is Snapchatting. Well, actually, she sent messages to Sheila about the wedding of Sheila's daughter. Had Suzanne made plans to attend the wedding? Virtually because of COVID, yes. Where was the wedding being held? In Indiana. 9.33, are there text messages between Suzanne and Barry? Yes, what are they? 9.33, she sent him a photo of a house in Salida on King Gulch Trail and talks about it being on the market. 9.46 a.m.? Yes, Barry called her for the fourth consecutive time. Did it appear to be answered? It was only 14 seconds, so we couldn't tell. He texted her within 20 seconds and said, hey. Then he called her again at 9.49, three minutes later. That was not answered. Working through May 9th, 2020. Is there messages between Barry and Suzanne at 9.50 a.m.? Barry messaged her, want to hike? At 9.52, she messaged, where? But he did not answer. Text messages from Suzanne at 10.30 on May 9th. Suzanne texted, do we have old summer tires for Rover? Is there a message at 10.36 a.m.? Yes. She messaged him, want to meet to hike? Did she respond? Barry responded 12 minutes later. No, I'll come home. Did Suzanne respond to him? One minute later, she texted, get hot tub stuff. Did you talk to Mr. Morphew about this text? CBI had discussed those with him. May 9th, 2020, 11, 27 a.m. Does Mr. Morphew return to the residence from the 105 Poncha Springs area? He does. What does he tell you he's doing? We don't discuss this with Mr. Morphew until the very end, but from his phone records, we could see that when he pulled up to the house, his phone was towards the river a little bit in the tree area before he would get to the residence. Agent Harris and I asked him, why are you in that area? He said he might have been looking for turtles. Turkeys. So 12.20 p.m., what is the next significant piece of information that you obtained from either the phone or the truck? The truck appears to be stationary at the residence. After that, for about, again, it was 11.50 to 12.20, we had Barry's phone pinging in a trail going down towards the trailer park. I showed Barry these photos and asked him what he was doing there, and he said he was looking for a turkey that Mallory had shot previously. Did he tell you when? that happened? He said she had shot a turkey some time ago. That wasn't recent, but this was in conflict with what he had told CBI that he was outside with Suzanne in the sun and they were eating veggie soup together for lunch. During the course of this investigation, are you familiar with game cameras being recovered? I am. At 12.55, does Barry text somebody? He texted Justin Sibrali and said, I'm home now. Give me a little more time. Justin had been texting him saying he was ready to meet with him. 1.46 p.m.? Yes, by now Barry was on Highway 50 heading into town and that is when he texted Tim KLCO and he asked Tim, are you around to look at backhoe? Is Suzanne doing anything on her LinkedIn account? Yes. At 1.42 p.m., she messaged Libler via LinkedIn. Guess who's alone again? At 2.03 p.m., was there something? Yes. She took a photo of herself and sent it. Previously admitted, People's Exhibit 59. Do you recognize that? I do. That is the picture Suzanne sent Jeff Libler at 2.03 p.m. Did you ever show that photograph to the defendant? I did. What was his response? He said that she appeared drunk in the photo. Did you follow up with that? Yes. We asked him a couple of times about this photo because we considered that her last proof of life and it was a photo taken of her. We didn't have her on surveillance film anywhere else. So we also asked Barry what she was wearing. What about the towel? But he would continue to say, looking at her eyes and say, those are drunk eyes. Mr. Lindsay, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Cross-examination by Ms. Nielsen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You just testified that Barry didn't call Suzanne on May 10th 2021. Again, she must mean 2020. Let's look at Barry's cell phone records 
that were produced in Discovery. Do you see the highlighted cell phone record? Yes. And what that says is that at 11.20 a.m., Barry made a call to Suzanne, correct? So that would be 6.20 a.m. Is that UTC time? That's already reflected as UTC minus 6. So you were inaccurate? Correct. These records also show that Suzanne's phone answered for a duration of three seconds, correct? Yes, that's what it shows. Let's look at 7.21 p.m. This shows another call from Barry to Suzanne. And you know this is the time that Barry is driving home from Broomfield, correct? Correct. According to this record, the call is not answered at 7.21 p.m. Yes, I'm showing you what's been marked and admitted as Defense Exhibit DD. That's the first 24 pages of the Burla report. You've seen that, correct? I have. You can turn to page 3, the record that says 51020 at 62138. See that? So you have page 1 of 624, or am I looking at, I'm sorry, page 3 of 624. Okay, on the Burla, we can see a call from Barry to Suzanne, correct? Correct. When we consider the offset for this Burla report, the Burla is showing a call from Barry to Suzanne at approximately 11.20 a.m. Yes. Now, if you could turn to the next page of the Burla and look at the last entry on 5.11.20 at 1.21.20 a.m. Do you see that entry? I do. And we have another call, the same call from Barry to Suzanne. Yes. If we can go back to the cell records on 5.10, Barry's next phone call after calling Suzanne at 11.20 a.m. was to Mallory at 12.06 p.m., correct? What records are these? These are the records that were produced in Discovery, the phone records. Okay, yeah, this just wasn't the method that I looked at them. Okay, you're familiar with? Yes, I am. So, yes, that would be correct. Okay, Ms. Nielsen, may I approach and show the witness defense exhibit G? Judge, Yes, Ms. Nielsen. This map in Defense Exhibit G was an attachment in the affidavit that you helped prepare, correct? That's correct. And you used the information, the data in this map when you questioned Barry on February 28th, 2021. That's right, Ms. Nielsen. I'd move for admission of Defense Exhibit G. Mr. Lindsay, no objection. Judge G is admitted. Ms. Nielsen, the affidavit that you assisted in writing and reviewed prior to Mr. Walker's signature indicates that this diagram represents an estimate of activity of Barry's phone as it appears to move from porch to porch, correct? Correct. Barry spoke to law enforcement by my account over 30 times, correct? That's probably pretty close. From May 10th, 2020 to the end of that year, he spoke with law enforcement by my count 23 times. Sounds high, but it could be. In these first approximately 20 interviews with law enforcement, Barry never said anything about shooting chipmunks when he arrived home on the afternoon of May 9th at 2.43 p.m., correct? That's correct. It wasn't until February 28th, 2021, over nine months later, that Barry says anything about shooting chipmunks at 2.43 p.m. Yes, and it wasn't until you told him definitively that when he arrived home that afternoon, his phone went around the house quite a bit. Yes. You then asked Barry, were you looking for her? I think I would at that point, yes. And after being told definitively that his phone went around the house quite a bit, and if he was looking for Suzanne, that was the first time that Barry said, I shoot chipmunks. Yes. What you told Barry about the phone moving around quite a bit is not a fact. Yes. Well, it's not a fact. Those yellow, you don't have it up on the screen, those yellow markers are where the phone was pinging. You just testified that you couldn't actually tell if the phone was bouncing around or if it was in one place. Correct. It's just like when it was when I spoke with cell phone experts. Again, I'm not one. So, what I'm trying to do as the FBI case agent is to bring the data in and use it as a tool to speak with Mr. Morphew. I understand. So, when I showed them both 
this and the strafing that we saw that morning of 510 I didn't I didn't show the cell phone experts this because they said because of the coverage we don't know for sure right however agent Harris and I both researched it there's something called ZRT location inside that gives you a little better clue that you're finding precise data and these had ZRT location but I'm still not speaking I can't say definitively these are precise but I I do see what seemed to me to be a pattern of activity and that's why I presented it to Mr. Morphew for him to explain it. But my question is, when you told Barry about this and presented it as a fact, it's not a known fact. It's as close to fact as I could get. Okay, let's talk about that. The yellow push pins on that diagram correspond with latitude and longitude points, correct? Correct. The coordinates come from forensic information extracted from Barry's phone. Yes, and the push pins purport to show the location of Barry Morphew's phone at various times, correct? Yes. The coordinates are also reflected in the Celebrite report. Correct, Ms. Nielsen. If I can approach and show the witness the Celebrite report marked as Defense Exhibit H. Judge. Okay, Miss Nielsen. This is the Celebrite report that was produced in Discovery showing the latitude and longitude associated with the coordinates on the map, correct? Again, I didn't look at a Celebrite report. We had a tool so I could look at the geo coordinates. Well, if we look at the first highlighted entry, let's flip to the back. We see the time of 244.02 to 244.05, correct? Correct. And those are the time periods that correspond with the push pin map, correct? Yes. And we see the latitude and longitude on this particular report. Right. Do you have any reason to doubt that information is different from whatever tool you used to look at the latitude and longitude? No. Same with the other coordinates on this page. Correct. Miss Nielsen. Your Honor, I'd move for the admission of Exhibit H. Mr. Lindsay, no objection. Judge, H is admitted. Ms. Nielsen, if I can approach with Defense Exhibit I for demonstrative purposes, it has numbers corresponding with the times. Ms. Nielsen, I want to talk about the time between the push pins on this map. According to your map, pin number one, the phone is supposedly at that coordinate between 1444.02 and 1444.05. Yes. And to to be clear, your theory is that Barry is carrying his phone as he's supposedly moving from porch to porch, correct? I didn't know how else it would get there. Assuming it's there because it could be in the same spot, right? Yes, that's why we asked him what he was doing. According to your map, it took one second from pin one to push pin two for the phone to move from push pin one to push pin two, correct? Correct. According to your map, it then took one second for Barry's phone to travel from push pin 2 to push pin 3. Correct. According to your map, it then took one second for Barry's phone to travel from push pin 3 to 4. Correct. Let's talk about the speed it took to travel from push pin 1 to push pin 2. To calculate average speed, you divide distance by the time it takes to travel that distance, correct? Yes. I want to insert the latitude and longitude coordinates that were extracted from Barry's phone. Let's go back to Exhibit H, which is the Celebrite data showing the latitude and longitude at point 1. That is 38.540096 minus 106. 0.237378, correct? Yes. Now, you've used Google Earth. You use it a lot in your job, correct? I did. In Exhibit 60, you were using Google Earth calculations, correct? Correct, Ms. Nielsen. If I may approach and show the witness what's been marked as Defense Exhibit J. Judge, you may, Ms. Nielsen. J shows the latitude and longitude and it puts it at that pinpoint number one, correct? Correct. Let's do the same thing for push pin two. Ms. Nielsen, if I may approach with defense K. Judge, that's fine. Ms. Nielsen, I'd like to move for the omission of defense J. Mr. Lindsay, no objection. Judge, J is admitted. Ms. Nielsen, I think I also failed to move exhibit I. Mr. Lindsay, I thought it was demonstrative. Judge Murphy, I thought so too, but now she's asking it to be admitted. 
Mr. Lindsay, it's already been admitted on G. Judge, it's a little bit. Miss Nielsen, it doesn't have the push pin numbers. Judge, it's a little different. Miss Nielsen, which for purposes of this hearing, I think it would be more convenient for us all to follow. Judge, I'll admit I, Miss Nielsen, the same thing for point number two. The Celebrite data shows this latitude and longitude is 38.540167 minus 106.237. 213. That's reflected on Exhibit K, correct? Yes. Ms. Nielsen, move for the admission of Defense K. Mr. Lindsay, no objection. Judge, K is admitted. Ms. Nielsen, now that we have the latitude and longitude coordinates entered for pinpoint 1 and 2, let's use Google Earth to calculate the distance between these two pinpoints. See that? Yes. Ms. Nielsen, I'm going to approach with a printout of that which is marked as Defense Exhibit L. Ms. Nielsen, the distance between point 1 and point 2 is 53.6 feet, correct? Correct. And that distance is reflected on Exhibit L. Yes. Ms. Nielsen, move for admission of L. Mr. Lindsay, no objection. Judge, L is admitted. Ms. Nielsen, this red line shows the straight line shortest distance between point 1 and point two is 53.6 feet, correct? Yes. And based on this overhead shot of the house, the shortest distance between the two points has Barry's phone traveling through walls of the house. Yes, that's what the diagram shows, but let's take that shortest distance, 53.6 feet, and let's divide that by the one second it took to travel from point one to point two. The average speed between point one and point two is 53.6 feet per second, correct? Sounds right. Ms. Nielsen, may I approach the witness and show the witness what I'm going to move for the admission of L? Judge, I think L has already been admitted. Ms. Nielsen, may I approach and show defense exhibit M? Judge, Sure, Miss Nielsen. This is a printout of a Google calculator converting feet per second to miles per hour. Move admission of defense exhibit M. Mr. Lindsay, actually, I think the witness has to identify that instead of Miss Nielsen. Judge, fair enough. Miss Nielsen, can you look at defense exhibit M, please? Does this purport to be a conversion of feet per second to miles per hour? It does. That was done on Google, correct? Correct. Do you have any reason to doubt the Google calculator conversion of feet per second to miles per hour indicated in this document? No reason to doubt it, judge. Any objection to M? Mr. Lindsay, no. Judge, M is admitted. Ms. Nielsen, so the average mile per hour between point 0.1 and point 0.2 is 36.8 miles per hour, correct? Yes. Since the phone can't travel through walls, the speed of the phone would actually have to go faster if it was traveling around the outside of the house from porch to porch, correct? That makes sense. So, if your map is an accurate representation of the precise location of Barry's phone, the phone had to travel an average speed of 37 miles per hour between point 0.1 and 2 if it went in a direct path. Sounds about right. You just testify that the telematics GPS coordinates were more accurate than the phone GPS coordinates? From my very layman perspective, yes. This demonstrates that, correct? Correct. Let's talk about precision and accuracy points. You are aware that latitude and longitude coordinates may be approximate. Yes. And you're aware that there can be a radius or margin of error associated with GPS coordinates. Yes. Again, we just demonstrated that. Yes. You've testified that you have experience reading Celebrite reports, correct? I don't read the Celebrite. Like I said, they have a tool that makes it a lot easier for us to read. Right, but you've seen a Celebrite report. Yes. I want to show you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit T. This is a printout of a Celebrite report, correct? Yes. And these are the coordinates that we just put up on the map correct? Yes, that looks like the same. You can also see the precision column was not populated by the version of Celebrite that was provided to the defense and used back in May of 2020 when this report was run. Yes, there's nothing in your precision column. I want to go back to if you could look at Defense Exhibit H. That's the Celebrite report showing the GPS coordinates reflected on the push pin map. Yes, you see the box with the column that is most populated on that document? Uh-huh. Did you trace down the source file? 
I did not. Let's show what happens when we trace down the source file. If you follow the source path, you get to a precision value that shows the horizontal accuracy of each latitude and longitude, correct? That looks correct. There's a precision column indicating how far the phone could have been away from the identified latitude and longitude point, correct? Yes, this is all news to me, but because I've never used this. So you didn't do this? Correct. According to the path, we just follow the precision value for point one starting at 24402 is 165 meters. Mr. Lindsay, judge, I'm going to object. Agent Grusing just testified this is the first time he's ever seen this. He doesn't use this tool. It's beyond his scope of his information he knows. Used a separate tool and that's not this tool. Ms. Nielsen, judge, this is from Celebrite, which he's indicated that he has experience working with and using. He's an experienced FBI agent, and this goes to scope. The weight, not admissibility. Judge Murphy, well, Agent Grusing, if we get to a point where you just don't know, you have to let us know and not guess. Witness, I've never worked with this. I have no doubt that what she's telling me is correct. It's just that I've never used this stuff before. If she wants to walk me through it, I'm fine. I'll just agree with her, but I have... <laughs> but I have no idea what she's talking about. Judge, right. If we get to a point where you're being asked to make a conclusion and you don't know the answer, you don't need to try and guess. Miss Nielsen, you just testified about your knowledge of ZRTC, correct? And again, so I don't have knowledge of what that even means. So Agent Harris and I, what happens with a case like this is we have a cast analyst report from Kevin Hoyland, who is a trained cell phone expert. But then Mr. Hoyland had to go on and do a lot of other cases. And so as we get new information that comes in, Agent Harris and I, who do not have training in this, it shows us the time and date and it will show a little Google map. So I'm not I don't have any training to question what this tool shows me is incorrect. So then I will take that and I will plug that into Google Earth to make something that I can actually read. Well, you testified that you can read Celebrite reports, correct? I can, but I don't, but you can. I can't, you're teaching me how to do it, yes. Well, that's following the source path in Celebrite Reader, which was produced in Discovery. Correct, but that's not what we use. I understand, but you've testified now numerous times that you have experience reading Celebrite reports, correct? Yes, I know what they are, Ms. Nielsen. May I approach and show a copy of a Celebrite report? Judge, is it marked? Ms. Nielsen, it is, triple C. Mr. Lindsay, judge, we can't do that. Ms. Nielsen, can't do what? Mr. Lindsay, we already have a triple C admitted. Judge Murphy, that's what I thought. Triple C was admitted yesterday. Ms. Nielsen, let's make it triple X. This is a copy of the Celebrite report showing the same dates and times, same latitude and longitude, correct? Yes, that looks correct. And look at number one. We see in this report a precision value of horizontal 165, correct? If we go to number two, the latitude and longitude for pin two, we see a precision value for horizontal 10, correct? Yes. And if you turn to the next page, pin three and four, you see a horizontal value of 10, correct? Yes. Ms. Nielsen, move for the admission of Defense Exhibit Triple X. Mr. Lindsay, may I briefly voir dire? Judge, yes, Mr. Lindsay. As you look at Triple X, is there any identifying information on there as to whose phone it is, name, number, anything like that? There is not. Mr. Lindsay, I object. Lack of foundation. Ms. Nielsen, I think that goes to wait. Judge, so you're saying this came through discovery? Ms. Nielsen, this didn't, your honor. The version that they ran did not populate precision. So we ran it through Celebrite, a more updated version, and it populates the precision column. He's just testified that clearly these are not accurate points. And this is demonstrating that there is a precision value associated with push pinpoints one, two, three, and four. They can laugh and scoff, but these are the pinpoints and these are the times. 
So again, I think it goes to weight, not admissibility. Mr. Lindsay, I'm going to ask for a foundation objection as well, Judge. If this is completely separate from anything that was provided in discovery, this witness clearly is not able to testify to any of the information in this document. Sounds like she needs to call her expert judge. So I'm confused. You said we ran it through. Miss Nielsen, that's right. Well, Your Honor, first of all, Ms. Roberts can trace the source path, which gives the same values as appear on this path. He's familiar on how to trace a source path. You just click through and follow it down until you get to a value. This document was run on a Cellbrite report just like what they did, but it's an updated version that populates those same values that you get from tracing the source path, which he could have done, which was produced in Discovery in Defense Exhibit H. He's also now testified that clearly those pushpin values are not accurate, that they are not precise. This is demonstrating that, Mr. Lindsay. It's still lack of foundation, Judge. He doesn't know this information at all. Judge, yeah, I understand that, but this is a preliminary hearing. Rules of evidence are relaxed. Frankly, I think this has already been established through the testimony of the agent. It's not like this is contradictory to what Agent Grusing just testified to. I'll allow its admission. I'm not sure how much weight I can give it without fully understanding the procedure and process by which it was generated. But again, I think this has already been established. Ms. Nielsen, thank you. If we can look at triple X as to push pin one, you will see that the precision data is 165 meters, correct? Yes, it says 165. It doesn't have a what sort of measurement it is. In the affidavit that you helped write, there is an opinion that Barry is, quote, most likely chasing Suzanne around while she is conscious, correct? I think that is in the affidavit, yes. Did you consider the precision information associated with the push pins when that statement was included? I did not. You're aware the more few neighbors were interviewed in this case. Which ones? The Ritters. Yes. Did the Ritters report hearing any type of argument or unusual noise on May 9th around 2.44 p.m.? They did not. Miss Nielsen, I'd move for admission of Exhibit T. I failed to do that. Mr. Lindsay, so now we're talking about T? Judge, yes. Mr. Lindsay, I have no objection, Judge. Judge, T is admitted, Mr. Lindsay. It's a bunch of numbers, Ms. Nielsen. I'm showing you what has been marked defense exhibit X, triple Z, and quadruple A. These are copies from Google Earth showing the radius at push pin 1 of 165 meters. That's X. Triple Z shows the precision radius of 10 meters, which was assigned to push pins 2, 3, and 4. Quadruple A shows the radius of those combined push pins. Do you have any reason to doubt this is, I don't, what it would look like on Google Earth? Correct. Ms. Nielsen, your honor, I'd move for admission of X, triple Z and quadruple A. Mr. Lindsay, no objection, Judge. Judge, X, triple Z and quadruple A are admitted. Miss Nielsen, I want to switch to telematics. You testified you did a deep dive into the telematics in this case. Yes, it was my first time to work with it. The thing about telematics that you've learned during your work in this case is that not every vehicle event is recorded. Correct, meaning there could be a car event that occurs that isn't recorded in the telematics. Yes, you testified that there were gaps in the information recorded. That's right, so a door may be open or closed, but it might not be recorded or captured by the telematics, correct? Yes. And CAST confirmed that the telematics download in this case does not appear to capture all activity. Correct. The way that law enforcement obtained telematics in this case from Barry's truck was by physically removing the module from his car, correct? That's my understanding. And the module looks something like this, correct? I never saw it. The module is located behind the screen in the dashboard of an F-350, correct? I didn't know that. You figured that law enforcement had to open up the dashboard and the screen to get that module. Correct. Was there anything about the appearance of Barry's truck when it was seized on May 10th? 
2020 that suggests that Barry had removed panels from his dashboard or obtained this module prior to law enforcement? No, I wasn't present for that. You've looked at photos of the truck, correct? Yes. In the affidavit, it's indicated that the interior dash area was dusty and dirty, correct? Correct. And kind of in general, Barry's truck was a mess. That's what I understand. A Burla report was generated in this case, and we just talked about Defense Exhibit DD, correct? Correct. And what the GPS data from the Burla indicates is that Barry's truck was parked in the driveway of his home from the afternoon of May 9 until the morning of May 10, correct? That's right, Ms. Nielsen. Can we maybe take our afternoon break while I try to locate my exhibit? Judge, okay, we'll be in recess for 12 minutes, Mr. Lindsay. I have one matter for the record if you want to do it now or after. Ms. Nielsen, oh, I found it. Judge, we're going to break anyway, so why don't you do that, Mr. Lindsay. So my record is, Judge, I'm asking for a copy of their expert report for the Celebrite. Under People versus Small, once it's admitted into evidence, I believe we're entitled to a copy of that. I have a cite for the court if you'd like. Judge Murphy, I'm not aware that there's an expert report. Ms. Nielsen, Judge, I don't have an expert report. I produced what Mr. Lindsay. Well, the Celebrite report that was done separate and apart from anything that we have. It's captured in Exhibit Triple X. Miss Nielsen, Your Honor, our expert used the USDR report produced by Discovery by the prosecution and ran a report. Mr. Lindsay, and it's an updated model that she even said was an updated model. People versus Small says if they use it in any shape or form, then we get a copy of that, Judge. Well, first, I need to understand what is in existence. So, is Triple X part of a larger document? Ms. Nielsen, no, Your Honor. Judge, so Triple X is it? Ms. Nielsen, Triple X is it? Now, we have the data that they have produced in the USDR file, the same data that they have. All they have to do is a software update, and they can run the same report. Judge, what you're saying is triple X is it. It's not part of a larger document, Ms. Nielsen. Well, Your Honor, we have the ability to run that information as do they. Judge, right, but Ms. Nielsen, but as far as I don't have a printout of every single thing, Judge, so it sounds like triple X is all there is. Mr. Lindsay, I don't think it does, though. Not to me, Judge. Judge, well, that's what Ms. Nielsen just flat out told me. So, unless you have some reason to doubt that, Mr. Lindsay, I do judge. It's a very limited, it only has the push pins in there. I believe there would be more information through the Celebrite. Judge, what I'm understanding is they did this procedure only on those four push pin locations. Ms. Nielsen, that's right. And what my people are telling me is it would probably be about 30,000 pages to print it all out. Judge Murphy, well, if triple X is all you have, Ms. Nielsen, that's all I have, Your Honor. Judge Murphy, then I think this is a moot issue. I'll take her word for it. That's all she has. Mr. Lindsay, fine. Judge Murphy, now we will go on break. Thank you. Pause in proceedings from 3.16 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Judge, we're back on the record on the Morphew matter. Mr. Morphew is present with his counsel, and we have the four attorneys from the prosecutor's office. Agent Grusing is still on the stand. You can commence your cross-examination. Miss Nielsen, thank you. Do you still have D.D. up there? Yes. If you could please turn to page 18. I want to look at the first door event that was captured on May 9th, which is labeled. You see that? I do. The first door open event that was recorded on the telematics at 10.05 on May 9th, correct? Right. Adjusted from the UTC. Right. Adjusted from the UTC. This location is not at the Morphew residence, but near one of his work sites that he was at on Saturday, correct? Okay, because you have in your investigation evidence that Barry was at work much earlier in the morning of May 9th, correct? He was working and on the move prior to 10.05 a.m. Yes, so it seems that Barry was opening and closing his door earlier than 10.05 on May 9th, but those door events were not recorded. 
Yes, let's scroll down to event four, which shows a driver door opening at 1.55 p.m. Do you see that? I do. From law enforcement's investigation, you know that at that time, Barry was at DSI, correct? That's what his phone was showing. And the surveillance from DSI? Yes. And the Burla data? correct? Yeah. You can plug the data in from the Burla and you can see it on Google Earth. Correct. A review of Barry's text messages, the interview of Justin Sabari, combined with the telematics, leads you to believe that around 2 p.m. on May 9th, Barry was getting the blade on his skid steer replaced, correct? Yes. Let's go back to the door event. After 1.55 p.m., the next door event that we have is number six, at 2.43 p.m., correct? Yes. And your investigation has revealed that Barry arrived back home at that time, correct? That is correct. If we put the latitude and longitude from the Burla into Google Earth, we see that he's in the Morphew driveway, correct? Yes. We see a door open event, but we don't see a corresponding door closed event, correct? That is correct. But as we just discussed, that doesn't mean the door was closed, correct? That could be correct. So when you talked to Barry on February 21st, 2021 and told him definitively that when he arrived home on May 9th that he left his driver's door open before he went to the first patio, this is not a fact. It is a fact from the data in front of me, yes, but we just discussed that not every event is recorded, correct? So you made an inference that the door wasn't closed, fully knowing that Burla does not capture all of the events. Well, I had nothing to the contrary. That's why I was presenting it to Barry to see if he wanted to either authenticate it or refute it. The next door event at 4.44 p.m. Do you see that? I do. Do you see that the latitude and longitude has slightly changed between 2.43 p.m. and 4.44 p.m.? Yes, it also had gear shift to neutral, gear shift to park, so that might explain that small variance. Right, there's a change in the latitude and longitude. Yeah, a very slight one. Still in the Morphew driveway. Yes, looking down the latitude and longitude on the door events, the latitude and longitude remains the same between 4.44 p.m. and 9.24 p.m., correct? Yes. Then, starting at 9.26 p.m. all the way through 3.49 a.m., there is a new slightly different latitude and longitude. Yes, both the 9.24 p.m. coordinates and the 9.26 p.m. coordinates are in the Morphew driveway, correct? Yes. At this time, there was a gear shift event where the truck was in reverse at 9.25 p.m. and then put into park at 9.26 p.m. Correct. We see the latitude and longitude from 9.26 p.m. on May 9th to 3.49 a.m., on May 10th does not change. That is correct. Let's turn to pages six and seven of the Burla report. The parking light events seem to correspond somewhat with the door events, correct? Correct. Now, just like with the door events, the telematics failed to record any parking light events on Barry's truck until 10.05 a.m. on May 9th. Yes, even though your investigation shows that Barry was on the move in his truck hours before 10.05 a.m. Correct. Let's look at the odometer events that were recorded. Page 21. This page looks similar to the door events in that it shows the event, the date and time, correct? Yes, there are only six recorded odometer events on May 9th, correct? Yes, a lot less recorded odometer events were recorded on May 9th compared to the door events that were recorded, correct? That's correct. Investigator Wren also participated in this investigation, correct? Yes. Now, Agent Graham and DA Investigator Wren spoke with Janelle Nepal at Salida Stove and Spa, correct? I know they went to the spa. I didn't know who they spoke with. Agent Graham, on May 19th, 2020 is when investigator Wren spoke with Janelle Nepal at Salida Stove and Spa. 
Agent Graham interviewed Janelle Nepel three days later, correct? Mr. Lindsay, Judge, I'm going to object. That sounds like testimony. The agent said he knows they talked to him, but doesn't know the date whatsoever. Judge, do you know the dates? Witness, I don't. Ms. Nielsen, you reviewed the cast in this case, didn't you? Yes, and you know that the cast report indicated that if Barry visited Salida Stoven Spa on the afternoon of May 9th after the 243 odometer read, then approximately 18 of the supposed missing miles were accounted for by that trip to Salida Stoven Spa on the afternoon of May 9th. You mind if I look it real quick? 29. Page 29? Yes. Based upon the movements of the truck, we do see and I'm happy to walk with you through all the driver doors, opening and closing. Yes, there are gaps, but I don't know when he would have had time to visit Salida Stove and Spa after 2.44 on 5.9. Did you consider Agent Graham's interview? You did a whole timeline, an FBI timeline in this case about what the events and what Barry's movements were on May 9th, correct? Correct. Did you consider Agent Graham's interview of Janelle Nepel at Salida Stoven Spa, who said that Barry came to Salida Stoven Spa sometime between 4 p.m. and 5.30 p.m. on May 9th? I did not. Did you consider the interview that DA Investigator Wren did of Janelle Nepel of Salida Stoven Spa, where she gave the same information? I did not because it would conflict with the telematics. How does it conflict with the telematics? At 444, his vehicle is at the residence. That's right. Is that between 4 and 530? Yes, but it doesn't tell you where the car was at 4. Correct. At 5? No. At 530? Correct. And we know that the telematics doesn't capture all the events, correct? Right. And we know the location of the truck changed between 2.43 and 4.44 p.m. Yes. And Barry was interviewed approximately 30 times. Did I ask you that question, sir? No. Mr. Lindsay. Judge. Objection. That's argumentative. Miss Nielsen, I believe he's being argumentative. Judge, well, I think she didn't ask you that particular question and you're going to get an opportunity to redirect. Miss Nielsen, did you consider Miss Nepel's statement to Agent Graham that when Barry Morphew came to Salida Stoven Spa on May 9th, between 4 and 5.30, that there was nothing unusual about his demeanor? No, I did not. Did you consider Agent Graham's conversation with Miss Nepel's son, Colton Nepel? No. And that Colton said he had been told by his mom that Barry had come into the store on Saturday, May 9th? I recall that he came in the store, but the times I don't. No, I didn't consider these times. Sir, you did a timeline, correct? A detailed timeline, and you didn't consider this information or include it in your timeline. That's correct. Did you consider that Colton recalled prior to Barry coming in on the afternoon evening of Saturday, May 9th, that Barry had called him and left a message about getting the hot tub repaired? Yes. In Agent Graham's presence, Colton looked at his phone and determined that Barry had left him a message on May 8th at 1.18 p.m. about getting the hot tub repaired? Yes. So, Colton showed Agent Graham a screenshot from his phone of a message that Mr. Morphew left where he called and was asking about getting his hot tub repaired, correct? Yes. Then we have a witness who tells two law enforcement agents that Barry was in the store the very next day between 4 and and 5.30 p.m., correct? If that's what he said in the interview, then yes. And he was inquiring and asking when Colton could come out and get the hot tub repaired? Yes. You have opined that without factoring in a trip to Salida Stoven Spa, there were 19 miles unaccounted for during Barry's trip to Bloomfield as opposed to the return, correct? Yes, there's a little less than that after doing some more math. However, Barry visited Salida Stoven Spa on the afternoon of May 9th after 2.43 p.m. Then approximately 18 of those missing miles are explained by this trip, correct? Yes, it wasn't until March 1st, 2021, nearly 10 months later, that Barry mentions following an elk, correct? 
that's correct. Barry never said anything about turning the other direction on US 50 in the first 25 times he spoke with law enforcement, correct? Mr. Lindsay, that is beyond the scope of direct. Foundation, Ms. Nielsen, your honor, we talked about the timeline. Judge Murphy, do you have another witness that's going to be testifying about this? Mr. Lindsay, yes. Judge, so it does seem to be beyond the scope. Ms. Nielsen, well, your honor, he's talked about the timeline of May 9th and 10th and the extensive review that he did of it. And he's also testified about his interview of Mr. Morphew. Right, but this specific issue was not brought up indirect, and it sounds like there's going to be another witness. Miss Nielsen, that's fine. I'll move along. Your theory is that Mr. Morphew did something to Suzanne when he arrived home at 2.43 p.m., correct? Yes. In your affidavit, you claim that, well, not your affidavit, the affidavit that you assisted with, you claim that Barry ran around his house at 2.44 p.m. Yes. And that he was most likely chasing Suzanne while she is conscious, correct? That's correct. The pushpin map exercise that we just went through refutes that Barry is running around from porch to porch, correct? It does not refute it. How would he get... You think he traveled 40 miles per hour, 50 miles per hour between walls? No, I'm not saying that the seconds are accurate. I wasn't even considering the seconds when I talked with him about the map. I was looking at the movements. I'm asking you now. Yes, from what you presented, is it physically possible for him to move that quickly? No. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay, that's correct. So, do you still believe that he was, you have evidence that he was most likely chasing Suzanne while she is conscious? Yes. How? His own statements. The chipmunk statement that he made months later in 2021, when you asked him and you said definitively that he was moving around quite a bit and that you had evidence of that. That's correct. You also have witnesses saying that Barry was in Salida Stoven Spa on May 9th, sometime between 4 and 5.30 p.m. inquiring about getting his hot tub fixed, correct? From what you've told me, yes. And that his demeanor was normal, yes. If those witnesses are accurate, Mr. Morphew did something terrible to his wife at 2.44 p.m., and then went to inquire about getting his hot tub service? I don't believe they're accurate on time. Can you explain the movement in Barry's car from 243 to 444, the change in the odometer? It looks very slight, as in, I can't, no, I didn't plot it. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Okay, this is a good time to break and just close this out. I think we've gotten through the bulk of day one and day two, some of the most important parts. They go on to talk, someone called it mind numbing. I believe someone meant the DNA portion is mind numbing, which I think is covered in either day three or day four. I did not request those transcripts of day three and day four. But as you can see, just from me scrolling through certain portions, of course, the defense has an objective to attack the data. You know, all these telematics and GPS coordinates and Google Maps, all these things, statistics are things that we didn't have as many as 10 or 20 years ago in trials. So if anything, the defense is probably hoping to confuse a jury so much and cause so much doubt in their minds that they'll say, I don't know what happened. But then we have to look at things logically and we'll have to see what makes the most sense when you're talking about a preponderance of the evidence. Hopefully most jurors just can't let themselves get confused with all these different versions of telematics and celebrate reports and precision accuracy. We can't have analysis paralysis to the point where folks don't know what the heck is going on. We have to look at what's likely the most probable scenario. So I'm just gonna close this out here and we will get to Barry's next hearing and see what happens. Thank you so much for watching. As soon as we get the arrest affidavit on Monday, September 20th, I'll start making videos about that. Let's close with Romans 12:21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good.